excited to be here. And I want to preface this that I want to make this into a discussion. I'm sure so many of you have so much to add. And I always feel personally that I learn better when it's a discussion. Studies show actually you actually retain the information better when it's a discussion. So I want to really make this into, into a discussion. And I want to hear what all of you have to say. OK, so we're going to start. Um, who thinks men and women are the same? What did you say? I'm sorry. Who thinks men and women are the same? Depends on what you want to say. OK, so let's the discuss. Subject. Let's discuss the differences. Men and women are different. How are men and women different? Physically, Who can give me physically, obvious, physically, beautifully. <laughs> physically, what else? Emotionally. Emotionally, amazing. What else? All their needs. The, the way they think, the needs their mental. Different. The way they think, mental, their mind. <clears throat> their needs. Their needs. So men and women are different in every single way. And how do we see it in the Torah that men and women are different? God gave a certain amount of mitzvahs to men and a certain amount of mitzvahs to women. Who has more mitzvahs? The men. The men, the men have more mitzvahs, amazing. Now, the reason is that women were given a special gift. Thank Every you. woman has this special, special gift. And because we have this special gift, we don't need as many mitzvahs. Anyone could think, what, what gift am I referring to? I mean, there are so many. But the gift but, to take Bina. care of the family? We have a gift to take care of the family. Beautiful. Bina. 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 That's, that's what I was thinking of. And because we have this Bina, what does Bina mean? Deep understanding. Beautiful. He has the spark of Hoffman Intuition. and we have the Bina. Beautiful. It's so Bina is, it's, it's a deep understanding and it's intuition. Therefore, we get the privilege of really taking care of the family. Probably sensitivity. Sensitivity. All of this comes along with it. So Bina is a special gift given to a woman. Men have it too, but women have it in an extra dose. Women have way more intuition than men. And therefore, we were given this special gift. And therefore, we actually need less mitzvot to connect to Hashem because we have it. We have it in, in us. We have this bina. We have this understanding. We have this deep understanding. We have this intuition. And we don't need as many mitzvot as men because we connect automatically. We don't need the constant reminder because it's just in us. It's deep within us. So why do they say Shiloh Asani Isha? Shiloh Asani Isha. Beautiful. So just a quick question. Why do we say Shiloh Asani Isha? Why do the men thank God for actually not making us Thank God for not making me a woman. Women, we're so, so lucky. We so have that's the, probably why, because of the extra mitzvot. Yes. Beautiful, amazing. Yeah. So we have the intuition, but with all that, we still have, they just thank Hashem for the extra mitzvot, but we don't need the extra mitzvot because we have the intuition. For example, everyone gets what they need. What, um, let's think of an example. Every, everyone has what they need. For example, a bird gets bird food and a horse gets you know, what they need. Would a, a bird complain, oh, how come I'm not getting hay? No. Would a horse complain, how come I'm not eating worms? No. Everyone gets what they need because we're all created different. And women are very, very special. We have this bina yisera. We have this intuitiveness. We have this special understanding that we could raise our families. We could lead, lead our life like that. And it's a very, very special gift. If you had to explain intuition, how would you explain it? I know we touched on it. If you had to explain it a little bit deeper, how would you explain it? Intuition? Yeah. The sense to do the right thing in the right time. Amazing. I love that one. I'm going to go with that. I never heard that one. Extra but it's, sense. It's an extra sense to do the right thing ashishi. in the right time. I That's call nice. it a hush ashishi. You That's know, we have five the sixth senses. sense. The sixth sense that a mother, a woman knows what to do at the right time. Amazing. It's the gift that a woman knows what to do in the right time. I love it. For example, if somebody, God forbid, couldn't smell, but they could see, they could hear, they could taste, they could feel, could you explain them the sense of smell? They have no, all the hard. other senses. It would be very, very hard. If somebody can't hear, could you explain them the concept of hearing? If, they, if they've never heard before, probably not. So too, in order to explain intuition, we have to feel it. We have to have it. If somebody doesn't have any intuition, it sort of it can't be explained. It can't be explained. If somebody lives their life only by logic, the intuition can't be explained. It's just like we can't we can't explain hearing to a deaf person. Okay, why is it hard sometimes to listen to our inner voice, to our intuition? Why is it hard? It's in us. Why would it be hard for us to listen to it? Do we tend to listen to it all the time? Let's start with that. No. No, not at all, right? I know for myself, I struggle with it. Sometimes the voice is there and it's telling me because to do this. Because sometimes it's out to do maybe what you needed to do according to your intuition. Your intuition will tell you to do some A and you do, maybe you because don't want to do you it want or to do. B or... No. Beautiful, because it's hard. It's, it's, it's a very, very hard. Why yeah. is it hard? Because we have the fear of failing, of mm. not 
doing right. the right thing right. and all these things. And, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. We have all these fears in us. We're failing, not doing the right thing. It's also society. Society says we should do this. This is what everyone's doing. And a lot of time in us, the, our intuition is telling us, don't do it. But how is it possible? Every single person is doing this, and I'm not going to do it. How is it possible? And how is it possible that... I, like, like what's going on here? So it's very hard to listen to our intuition because a lot of times it, go against, it goes against society and a lot of times it goes against logic. Like if you put everything on paper, like a lot of times people who make like a business deal, put everything on paper, logically I should make this deal. It makes a lot of sense. But a lot of times intuitively a woman's going to say no, no. They're for some reason, and I can't even put it into words. A lot of times we can't put it into words, which makes it more challenging. I shouldn't go with this deal. And that's the voice inside us, and it's hard because we can't put it into words, it goes against society. But I really believe that that's our neshama speaking. Our neshama is our voice. It's, it's a piece of Hashem. It's a piece of Hashem, a piece of God is in us, and it's the voice that's telling us to do the right thing. Each and every one of us has the peace of God in us. I mean, how special is that? I mean, God, He created the world. It's Salam Elohim. Beautiful. God loves us so much. And with, while he created us, he made us a beautiful body. With all that, he put in a soul, he put in a neshama, a piece of himself in, a, in us. And with that, that is the gift that we know how to lead our life. How should we lead our life? How, what should we do? Should we go with what society says? Should we do what our friend's doing? Should we do logically what's the right thing? We have to listen to that inner voice because that's the inner voice that tells us how to lead our life. Any questions or comments or disagreements There's so far? There's a difference, I think, between men and women. Men are more logically and what's, what needs to be done, and women goes more according to her intuition and sensitivity and stuff like that. Beautiful. Amazing. So men live, live by logic, and therefore they need more mitzvot because they, they're going by the logic. But women, we have the vo Men have this intuition also. But women, we have it so much more. We hear our neshama so much more. So that means we're connected so much more. Therefore, automatically, we, we need less mitzvahs because we need less reminders. The men who don't have the intuition as much, they need it so much more. Well, that's why they have us. Yes. And so they have the women too. Okay. So I'm, I want to discuss examples in the Torah where we see, where we see intuition. So in this week's parsha, anyone know this week's parsha? Beautiful. Beautiful. So Matos Masse, we have a double parsha. There are two small parshios. And in this week's parsha, we discuss the daughters of Tzalafchad. Anyone, anyone ever heard of them? Anyone want to share it with us? The, of whom? Is the daughters of Tzalafchad. There were five Tzalafchad. daughters of Tzalafchad. Yes. Were, were they the, the ones that uh, were mentioned in Is the... Previous yeah, part. previous parsha. Anyone want to share the story that happened with the daughters of Tzalafchad? Something with inheritance, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was this discussion. It doesn't have a boy, maybe. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, and I, just what I remember from the years. And uh, the question is that they are deserve inheritance. Amazing. Which is you, that time it was only for boys or for That's the right. firstborn. That's right. So exactly beautiful. So what happens is the laws of inheritance were taught. And they're passed down to the boys, to the sons. But there was this man, his name was Tzalafchad, and he died. Anyone know how he died in the desert? He was actually killed. I know. Oh. I mm. Who killed him? He, he was actually Shabbat. killed. I'll say the story. He did he, something with Shabbat? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. He was the first person to break Shabbos. He was the first person to break Shabbos. Oh, he was the first person to break Shabbos. Oh, he was Shabbos. Etzim, right? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Etzim. Yeah. He was the first person. He broke Shabbos <laughs> publicly. And they were just taught by Moshe Rabbeinu, whoever breaks Shabbos publicly, and they get a warning. Things were so clear in those days, they get killed. So why the distinction of publicly? It has to be publicly because it has to be, everyone with, has to see. With witnesses. It has to be known. It has to be witnesses. They have to get a warning. You should know, throughout history, Basin almost never killed anyone. A Basin that killed one at a set, one person in 70 years is considered a strict Basin. Like this rarely, rarely happened that somebody had to be killed. What happens is this man, his name is Salaf Chad, he's a, he, he loves Hashem so much, he has this fear of God. And this goes a little off topic, but his goal in breaking Shabbos is he wanted to teach Klal Yisrael, he wanted to teach all the Jews what happens if you break Shabbos. He wanted oh, to put a fear in them. It wasn't the right thing. So he sacrificed himself, basically. He sacrificed himself. With all that, it wasn't the right thing. We don't, we're not supposed to do things like that. But anyways, that was his goal. His goal was to show everyone, don't break Shabbos, because if you break Shabbos, look what, look what happens. For example, if 
you could tell your child, don't put your hand in the fire, don't put your hand in the fire, and let's say you, you know, the child hopefully will listen. But if they see someone actually putting their hand in a fire and get burned, will the child ever put their hand in a fire? No. Like, no. never, because they've seen it. They've almost experienced it. So, too, the goal of this Salafrad, who is a great man, was to demonstrate to everyone, don't break Shabbos, because this is what's going to happen. Don't even think of breaking Shabbos, because this is what's going to happen. But don't you think that the intention was good? The intention was amazing. And Hashem knows our intentions. But God knows our intentions. So why were they killed? It's not, it's not the way we're supposed to live our life. Because we're not. If intention was good, why was it killed? Because intention is very important to Hashem, but with all that, it's intention and action. And it, that's why we have to always go according to the Torah and our intuition, because if we don't, I feel like things like this happen. So this is like actions are louder than words? Is that the same idea? Actions are, yeah, you could say actions are louder than louder than words and for God for Hashem intuition is so important it's, I mean um, our, our reason for doing things are so important and people may not know it's so important but God the reason makes a difference for God but with all that he did the action so what happened was he was killed he was killed and anyone was know he stoned? he was I think he was stoned yeah yeah. that's the if somebody that's breaks Shabbos yeah. they're stoned but first first actually killed before they're stoned so it's not like necessarily that painful I mean it's painful but it's not like people are stowing, throwing stones and they're being killed first. I think they're thrown off of a, mount, uh, of a mountain and they die, and then they're stoned. Mm. So, anyone know how many children he had? Five. Five, amazing, five, five daughters. So Tlachot had five daughters. Like we said, the law of inheritance is it's passed down to a son, passed down to boys. So B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people, were taught the law of inheritances. And here we go, we have five daughters who are told, okay, we, we, learned the laws, we learned the laws, we don't get, we don't get land, we don't get land. God taught us the laws and therefore, if we learn the Torah, we're not gonna get a plot of land. And our father, our father was killed, it's not like he even died, he was killed, he sinned, he sinned for the, you know, he had good intentions, but with all that he sinned, and therefore we won't get a plot of land. So if you put it all on paper, what does it seem? They don't deserve it. Beautiful, this, they don't deserve it, this is just the way it is, you know? You won't get a plot of land. But intuitively, it was their neshama speaking that said, it's not okay, it's not okay, this is, this, this is not okay. We need to have a plot of land. It's, it's their neshama speaking because if you put everything, have you ever done like you're not sure if you wanna do something, you need to make a decision, you write pros on one side, cons on one side, should I make a decision, should I not, like what should I do, what are the pros, what are the cons? So if they wrote everything down on paper, would it come, that they des would it come out that they deserve the plot of land? Because normally you have a brother who takes care of you if you don't get any land, but there was no one. There was no brother, land. exactly. But the laws were taught that this is the way it is. Yes, that was with the consideration that someone will take care of them. Beautiful. So that's like their neshama speaking that, but somebody was supposed to take care of them. Beautiful. So their neshama, their intuition spoke and said, one minute, this is not okay. Had they asked people for advice, I imagine most people would have said, this is a halacha. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the way it is. This is the law. This is the way it was taught. Like, I don't think you have a case. But these five daughters were intuitive, they, which means they listened to their, their neshama and they said something is wrong here, it's not okay. So they went to Moshe Rabbeinu, they went to the leader, and what did the leader say? Let me talk to the boys. Story. Beautiful, amazing. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, Moshe, Moshe the leader. Not, you know, he could decide by himself. Moshe, was such a good <coughs> question that Moshe didn't know the right answer. Moshe had to ask God. Moshe had to ask God. It was such a brilliant and amazing question because it was their neshama speaking. It wasn't logic. It was their soul speaking. And he had to ask God. And what did God say? Yes. Beautiful. God said yes. And not just that. The Jews learned new laws of inheritance. How inheritance, how land is passed down. There's new laws of inheritance that are learned because of that. I'm and, mixed up, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes is what? What do you mean, yes to what? They'll get the land. But they will be in a, the girls. So they will get the land. land. They will get okay. the land, even though it was taught that only boys get inheritance. So it was going to be the older one who got it. The all oldest? of them, I think, all of them. All of them. There's five daughters. All of them were going to get it. So originally, it was just they were taught that just boys get the land, and now it's taught that it's different. The girls are getting girls are inheriting, and not just that. It was the law was was taught for the whole. Whenever there's a case like this, for the whole, all the whole Jewish nation, the laws are taught now because of these five girls of Tlefchad who had a question. 
And logically, they didn't really have such a case. But with all that, what they do, they listen to their neshama, they listen to their soul, and therefore they went to Moshe, their leader. And it was such a good question that Moshe had to ask God. And because of them, new laws of, of inheritance are taught for the whole entire B'nai Israel, for the whole Jewish nation. Again, because they listen to their, they listen to their inner voice, they listen to their intuition. There's a second time that these daughters went to Moshe with another case, with another question. Anyone know the second one? No. So the second one is it's similar to the first. This one is in Parshas Masse. These daughters said, so inheritance always goes by what, usually? The boys. The boys. Beautiful. It goes by the boys. So what's going to happen? We're going to get married. What will happen with the land now? Beautiful. We're going to get married, and we're going to marry someone from a different Shevet. I think they were from Shevet Yosef. What is a Shevet? A Shevet is a tribe. tribe. So they were split into really 13 tribes. And we are going to, we're going to get married. For example, I'm from the tribe of Yosef. So I'm going to marry someone from the tribe of? Levi. Okay. I, from Levi. Um, Levi didn't, didn't really have a land. Let's, guess, let's do another one. Wow. Done. Beautiful. Amazing. Done. Done. Levi's good, but just they, their land's a little more complicated. So done. I'm going to marry someone from Shevet Dun. And then my plot of land is always going to go down to Shevet Dun, to the tribe of Dun. And it won't go to the tribe of Yosef anymore. So this, the plots were split up, the land was split up in tribes, in Shvatim. But what happens is, if these women marry someone from a different tribe, their land is not going to be part of their tribe anymore. Any questions on that? I know it's a little complicated. Hmm. No? Okay. No, so, but doesn't it ask to go to her children, to her children? So what happens is it's going to go to her children. Right. And if a, good, it's going to go to her children. Now, if a, But it depends if she stays in Shevet Yosef or she goes to live with her husband, Dan. Beautiful. Amazing. So if a, if a, if a child is Jewish, is determined by the mother. mother, what power we have. The tribe of a child is determined by the father. father. So therefore, it will be part of the father's tribe. So they were well, a question. They want their they want their father Tzalafcha to be remembered, and here we go. We have this land, but we're going to marry. We could marry someone from Dun, Naftali, any tribe, and therefore the land is not going to be part of our tribe's land. Our father will sort of be forgotten. So according to logic, I don't know if they have such a good question, but intuitively their neshama, their soul was speaking, and they went to they asked Moshe, and anyone know what happened after that? What do you think happened? Moshe asked God, what a good question. Again, these women, the power of a woman, the power we have is so great. We just need to know that we have such great power. The neshama, their neshama was speaking. They asked Moshe. Moshe didn't know. Again, Moshe asked God. And then a new halacha was taught that a, if a woman inherited, inherits, she marries someone within her tribe. So they're from Shevet Yosef, and they will marry someone from Shevet Yosef, and therefore the land will we'll stay, stay in their tribe. But so, but what if she marries somebody from Dan? Well, so it means she's not allowed, kind of, to marry somebody from another Shevet. It means or well, she must marry somebody from Yosef. She must marry someone from Yosef. But listen, God determines <coughs> who we're going to marry anyway. <coughs> so God had this all pre-planned. So her Bashert, her husband, was going to be in that tribe. But again, this halacha was for all of all the Jewish nation, the whole, cl- the whole B'nai Israel, and therefore this was taught to everyone. In their merit, because they listened to their neshama, their soul, another halacha, another law was taught to the entire Jewish nation. Yeah, and then I'm going to go to you afterwards. I have a little problem with sure. the statement that God determines who we're going to marry. Uh-huh. Why do we have divorces then? That's a very good question. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, no, no, that's exactly, is that your question? I was going to ask if about the gets. So. Why did they do yeah. it? That's, okay. That's, okay. Very good. Well, touch on this topic a little, it's off topic, but I, since you asked it, it's a great question. Since two of you have the same questions, I, I want to touch upon it. So the concept of divorce. So it's, I'm going to touch upon it. There's really, I mean, I've heard 10. There's really around a, a, a child is born and there's, there's a voice that says this, Child A is going to marry child B. This girl is going to marry this boy. What happens is they have, let's say, let's say they get married at 30. They have all those years to work on themselves, right? And they change. And, of course, we believe in free will. God doesn't ter- determine the person that we are. We have free will. And whatever, we only decide what person we're going to become. So person A, child A is going to decide what they become. And child B is going to decide what they become. They're two different people. 
So what happens is, it's not that we have one person that we're meant to marry. Potentially, I, we have more than one. Right, potentially. I, I've heard 10. I don't know if it's like a, just a number. I don't know if it's just a number, but there's more. It's whatever we're, left, we're at at the age of 30 or whatever the age that we're going to get married, 20, 50, 70. There is one person that's meant for us at that time. So it, it, could, be ch it could be A, it could be B, it could be C. It could be someone else. So one person. Now, the concept of divorce, you shouldn't, like, I remember I met, I met someone at a park. She, she was a Christian woman, and she was telling me she was struggling with her marriage. And she was like, you know, I'm being abused. And it was obvious from what she was saying that she should get divorced. It was so simple. And she said, you know, my religion, we don't allow divorce. And I said, that's so interesting because in Judaism, we actually, it's a mitzvah. It's actually a commandment to get divorced. It's a mitzvah. Meaning, if somebody needs to get divorced, not just do they get divorced and they, that's the protocol that they have to take, they actually get a mitzvah by getting divorced, if it's the right thing to do. It's a mitzvah. They do a mitzvah by getting divorced. So the concept of divorce is I feel like God gives us lots of free will, and sometimes when we're 30, we're over here, and we're each growing, we're each changing, and when we're 40, maybe we grew a lot, we changed a lot, and our spouse didn't change a lot. I mean, there's so many different reasons. Our spouse didn't change a lot and we're a different person. Or maybe we were meant to, maybe we were abused and we were meant to go through this and grow through this and change through this and marry somebody else. But it's, it, there, is a concept of, there is a concept of divorce. We're lucky, I mean, that God gave it to us. We're Jewish people and God knows that sometimes we get married and we make a mistake. We simply make a mistake and we need to get divorced and we need to make the change. But it's a lot of, it's, it's the intuitive voice that we need to listen, number one, when we get married, which is so hard because it's an infatuation, there's excitement, there's so much energy. So there's so much of that. So it makes it hard to listen to our inner voice, our neshama. And afterwards, if we see something's very, very wrong, again, we have to listen to our neshama and we can get out. We can get out. There's a, pro, there's a process of a get. There's a process of divorce. And it's a mitzvah. It's a, it's a good thing to do if it's necessary. But the man is the one that gives you the gift. One hundred percent. The man is the one that that has the oh, obligation has the to give the gift. Um, has yeah, the man has the power to give the gift. With all that, he is obligated to do it. Yes, the it's man. Kind of humiliating. I went through it. I you went through it that. Humiliating. Yes. You went through it. It was humiliating that the the man the had to give the gift. Yeah, I, the I forget the, what the word is. The, the ceremony. I release you, whatever they say. What is the expression? Do you remember? I don't know, actually. My husband, is that, I don't know if Rabbi Greenblatt, he, I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Rabbi he's Greenblatt. He's the one that came from Memphis. He met, went, yeah, yeah, he's so, the one that gave me the gift. Oh, wow. So Rabbi Greenblatt, we're pretty close to him. My husband's a rabbi, so my husband is a lot of times a witness. You need two witnesses Correct. to give, to give a divorce. So my husband, I've never actually been at a ceremony. I don't know, I don't want to call it a ceremony, but at an event like that. And the truth of the matter is when someone ever tells me they get divorced, I usually tell them Mazel Tov, congratulations, because I know it was a, no, a, a long journey. Get Gmar Tov. Oh, Gmar Tov, is that what you're supposed to say? Okay, good. Get Gmar Tov. Get Finish, finish nicely. Because oh, it's not, but they make it sound uh, like it's Gmar Tov. You should finish nicely. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a... <laughs> Again, you've gone through it, and I believe you. I take your word for it. I'm sorry that it's degrading, and it shouldn't be degrading because it's it's a mitzvah from the Torah, and it shouldn't. It it was degrading for you or for both? For anybody? It, it no, just, no, no. I mean, it, it's for it's the way it's done, and I don't remember exactly. It's been a long time, <coughs> but it was something about the way the guy does. The guy, the husband, he he says something. Yeah, and there's a little piece of paper that they, I don't remember now the details, it's been really a long time. Thank God I had another marriage, it was wonderful. <laughs> so, but yeah. Okay. I don't remember Sorry about now. that. I'll have to look into it. So I wanted to, it's interesting that the Torah uses, I mean there's a lot of examples that women, um, that we hear that women use um, their intuition, women hear their neshama, their soul speak. But here we hear a group of women, five women, they hear their neshama speak twice. And I feel like this is a real lesson that God wants to teach us. What lesson do you feel that God wants to teach us, that he shows us these five women twice listening to their neshama, listening to their intuition? What do you feel, what lesson perhaps would Hashem, God, want to teach us? The 
אני טועה. But women need to listen to her inner voice. Her Beautiful. Inner voice is... And women need to listen. <coughs> women need to listen to our inner voice. It's a mishkal, it's a way. We have a special yeah. gift. We need to listen yeah. to our inner voice. Amazing. Any, any, other, any other lesson? We have to yeah. believe in ourselves. Our Women, we question ourselves. We have to believe in ourselves. Self- in ourselves. We have to believe in our, our worth. Our self-confidence, our worth. Yeah. Our self-confidence, our worth. Beautiful. We have to believe in ourselves. Women, we, I think we question ourselves more than men. I know I definitely question myself more than my husband. So I think it's, it's some, we have to believe in ourselves. Beautiful. What else? I'm focusing on it twice. They did it twice. Yeah, they used their intuition twice. We will not, we will just do anything to reach our goal. Like what, determined? Beautiful. Determined. We're, we're doing it twice. We're going to reach our goal no matter what. It's against logic. It's against everything. Women I have to get the determination. I think men are more like step-by-step step thing. Okay, I'm here. I'm going to do this. You know, whereas a woman, I, I, the way I was taught was to look at from all the angles, like the, you know, the religious, the intuition, what I, my mom would have done, what is expected of me, what I need to do according to what I am and what my Yitzhaha is. So I'm going to fight that. So if I have like five different, you know, uh, things that I go through. I don't just Beautiful. listen to myself. I just, I tell myself, what would God want me to do? What do I need to do? What my mom needs to do? What the Torah said I need to do? And then what my intuition, what, what the inner child inside of me says that I want to do. Beautiful. What I really want to do and what I need to be doing and what's the best for, and what my Yitzhaha, what's, you know, and then I just like, And then I give it like, if it's a really big thing, I just say, okay, you know what, I leave it to God. And then one big thing I learned how to do is like, uh, should I do it, should I not do it? And then the thing that we, a lot of us never were taught, I, what if I just leave it alone and let God and just wait another second, two days, three days, four days, five days, mm-hmm. I don't have to take a decision right away. And a lot of uh-huh. people have that sense of urgency. Right. And that's, yes. that third uh, box is usually... A very good box to take you wow. know just wait and see what happens and then you decide and then God gives you and it's really funny because God always give if you learn how to listen to what the messages that God sends you somebody's you're going to talk to somebody or listen to go to a shiro or, or have any situation go to Home Depot and somebody's going to say something and you go oh my god that's what God wants me to do wow that's and beautiful. that's what I go I mean that's like okay this person just gave me the key beautiful that's so nice and that's usually how you know It's beautiful. And that's the whole woman. We look at the, we look at the big right, picture. That's right. beautiful. And men are just like, okay, what do I do next? They don't see the whole picture at all. It's like, boom, 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 boom. That's what wow. they have us. The other thing that huh? you're saying. That's what they have us. Yeah. They need help. I, I love the concept that you said about waiting, the third box. I know I right. struggle with it. I don't like to be in between. Either I'm doing this or in this. I can't be in between. But it's, it's, it's such a good decision. It's such a good choice to learn to wait. Learn to be, mm. take away the urgency. It's so hard. It's really hard. But you it's know, good. I, I, to, To me, the most important is like, I, I know it's, and I'm sure it's like from the Bible, but everything to me, it's like, what would are people going to say? Not what are they saying today. What will we say when I pass away? What my kids are going to say about me? What my grandkids are going to say wow. about me? What my, if I, my husband is after me or before me? And what my niece and my nephew are going to say? You know what she did for us? She did this and this and this and this, you know? Because at the moment, people are ungrateful, so they're, not, right. they're never going to say what they did and the reality of the fact. So because sometimes, like even in a, in a congregation, it's always the same people that because they get the merit and the right. people that are working behind the scene, you know, they're never going to get anything. Right. So, you know, whatever, whatever. What a good way to live your life. It's hard, but to remember that, like, you know, what they are people going to say afterwards? Right. What are very... people going to say about you? The true, I mean, the people that know you and right. what, you know. This is such a good way to live our life. Mm-hmm. It's hard, but an amazing, amazing way. This way we remember what's actually important right. in life. Amazing. And I'm going to yeah, do you next. Just what I wanted to say about happening twice. When things are happening twice or a dream or intuition is stronger, this is the hook. So the, if it was once, oh, okay. But when it's twice and three times, that's chazaka. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. The concept of it's happening more than once, chazaka, more than once. Beautiful. Yeah. Rabbi will be doing the class. No, no, go ahead. No, no. Forget it. It's important. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, yeah? yeah okay. I have to say. No, forget it. Okay, if you change your mind, no, let us know. <laughs> so I love all your thoughts about, about like, the concept. All of you have amazing, you know, amazing thoughts about the concept of twice, more than once. So what I was thinking is the concept of intuition, the concept of listening to our neshama, our soul, 
I think God is telling us the more we use it, the more we'll hear it. Like the more we we get used to listening to the messages of God, like you were saying, the more we'll hear it. You know, it's a hard habit to get into, but the more we the more we do it, the more it's going to become natural. Like, oh, this is just natural. What's my neshama? What's my intuition saying? It's going to become more natural. So, for example, any of you guys are into wine? No. I'm really not. I, I just, I like head of wine. That's my favorite. Manischewitz, exactly. <laughs> but if you ever, I know my husband appreciates wine, but I know there's some people who actually have a job as a wine taster, and they could actually taste wine and know, is a wine expensive? Is a wine cheap? And the differences are so subtle that a regular, ordinary human being can't tell but a wine taster can. Why? Because a wine taster, he uses that sense so often sensitive. that it, it, it becomes very, very sensitive. The more we use a sense, the more sensitive it becomes. Any sense, for example, tasting food, any type of food, the more we taste food, the more we, you know, the more we taste any type of food, the more sensitive it becomes. Our, our sense of smell, if somebody works with flowers the whole time, they would be smelling different flowers and their sense of smell would become that much stronger and that's that much more sensitive. So too, the concept of intuition, it's our sixth sense, like you said, it's the sixth sense. And it's a sense like any other, except we can't explain it in words. But the more we use it, the stronger it will become. The more we'll hear it, the more we listen to God's voice, the more we'll listen to the voice that's inside of us, the stronger it will be and the, the more we'll hear it. So that's why it happened twice. They listened to it once, again, they listen to it twice. And so, too, we should know in the beginning it's going to be very, very hard if we make a decision to, I'm going to listen to my intuition. I'm going to listen to God's messages. I'm not used to it. This is new to me. This is, this is hard for me. It's, it's, not, it's not what I'm used to. I just like doing what society says. I just like going according to logic. It's going to be very, very hard. But with all that, if we do it, know in the beginning it's going to be hard, but it's going to get easier. And soon it's going to become almost natural. It's always probably going to be a struggle. I'm sure it's always going to be a struggle. Life always has to be a struggle. That's what life's all about. But with all that, we're going to get used to it, and it's going to get easier, just like the daughters of Tzalafat. It got easier and more natural, because it's going to be there. Okay, I want, I, want, I want us all to think of an example. I want to show you all that each of us have intuition. And each of us, there has been a time, at least once, I'm sure there's more than once, but there has each been a time that each and every one of us has listened to that inner voice, has listened to God speaking to us, and has listened to our intuition. So I want it to be quiet. And I want you all to think of an example to prove to yourself that you listen to your intuition. Prove to yourself that you listen to the, the voice of God talking to you. So I want it to be quiet, and you guys are all going to think, think, think of an example. And then you don't have to share it. It's going to be optional to share it or not. But I want you to prove to yourself that you have done this before. And through that, that's level one. And then we can get better and better at it. Anyone, I'm sure, I'm sure you, some of you still need more time to think and you could go home and think more. Anyone want to share anything? Totally optional. Okay, I, I'll, I'll tell you. I don't know if it's a very good example, but I had a guy call me up one time uh -huh. when I was in between marriages. No, it was after my second husband died. Uh -huh. And he was telling me this story. He made very good sense, but he made, was telling me this story that he drives this car and I don't even remember. Some very, very fancy, very, very expensive and he was living in this wonderful high rise and he sounded like he was loaded and he sounded like good company. And then I thought to myself, you know what? Something is not right over here. I don't know if I really believe it. And we had a date. He was gonna come pick me up and then he didn't show up. Hmm. So I had his number to call and I called the house and the woman answered the phone and I told her who I was and she said to me, listen, the guy has emotional problems. Wow. Don't get involved with him. And that was the end of it. Amazing. And I was thinking, you know what? That was when I, it just did not sound right. It was too good to be true. And my second husband used to say to me always, if it's too good to be true, that's what it is. 
It's not mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. That's a great example. You listen to your intuition afterwards. You were lucky that actually got proven that your inner voice, that your neshama was was saying the right thing. Anyone else want to share an example? Totally optional. Yeah. Yeah. The the most uh, common thing as a parent, and I'm not going to go into detail, is shidduchim. When a mother knows, shidduch for your son, yes. for your daughter, knows this is not for my son, and of course he's not going to listen to you. Mm. <laughs> and then, uh, beautiful, and a then great it's, example. And you write, and then yeah. you say to our kids, you know, some kids do not want to listen to parents, but parents have experience, and parents have inter, inside uh, intuition to know. But don't you think it's anyway important to say something? And I did. It. No, no, we did. We, did. we said. Because I can tell you this: what happened <laughs> no. when I went out? We when did. I, when we I did. went out with my first husband, nobody could stand him. Nobody said one word to me about him. No, I got people married, said, and we said. And my sister, when I finally left him, my sister said, "I knew it was the wrong person from the minute I met him." And then I'm thinking, you know, <coughs> if you really observe something like that, it's almost a, must a mitzvah, say. a must to it is. speak it's up. It is, a mitzvah. It's hard but to I do. I think people are afraid to speak yeah. up in case they're wrong, you know? I think people also feel, I mean, I know I, I experienced such an example where it's hard to speak up because a lot of times a person is, you feel like the person won't listen to you. Although the person may, you just feel like the person won't listen to you, but the right, the right thing would, yes, do, to speak, would be well, to speak up. Well, even my father, you know, I never said one word to anybody about my marriage, but it was very obvious. When I went to tell my father that I was leaving my, my husband, you know what he said to me? What took you so long? <laughs> but he never wow. said a word. Mm -hmm. I stuck it out for 25 wow. years. Mm -hmm. Nobody said a word. Wow. Maybe he should have at that time. Even that today, I have one that is now into Shiduchim. And I know she's going, she's searching not the, the exact what she, it fits her. And I told her a few times, she got insulted. Mm. She got insulted and said, you know what? Whenever you be ready and see that what I'm saying, whatever I'm telling you, it's not, you're not, let's say you're not in the right, in, in one of them, I say you have to stay in your, uh, koma, in your koma, level. in your level. level. It doesn't mean level I'm better than you, but your koma is mean the people that are exactly like you. Only last week she said, and she, she did say, Ima, you are right. She said, I'm sick and tired of A, B, C. I said, oh, I'm happy. It came up on you. Wow. Yeah. Now I need to change, she said. I said, Baruch Hashem. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I, I was afraid, really, she was going to go with whatever she's searching, and it's not for her. Yeah. It was really strong intuition that it's not for her because I know her. Mm. Anyway, wow. it's true. We we have that. It's it's tough. Yeah, it's very tough. Very tough. Anyone else want to share anything? I wanted to share. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I had some situations when I was right, and I'm happy that I insisted, and it was not easy. But I also regret, even though it was not in my hands, when I had. A, very strong bad feeling and I didn't act enough wow. in that regard. Wow. I could I, I could know that I could have changed much mm -hmm. but something was terribly wrong. Yeah, yeah but sometimes I, Yeah, it's so hard. I could relate to that when something's wrong and you say something or you don't do it enough and it's no one's on your side, but again your Nishama is your soul speaking you have to do something and it's it's a very, very hard situation, but we have the gift that comes along with sometimes it feels like a burden sometimes that you're the only one who, <coughs> who knows, but it's, it's hard to bring it down for people but to sometimes listen. It's challenging. We have to go through so people, everybody has to go through something very painful. To learn. To learn, and that is, you have to go through all that no matter what happens. Yes. So as a reference, and it's just like something, because this is the experience, this is the challenge you have to go through for you to grow and become the person you need to be. And so it's either that person A, B, or C that's going to give it to you, but, and you're going to have to fall to learn from it. And that's the only way to do it. I mean, you have to burn sure. yourself to figure out what it's all about being burned. Sure. That's, all, that's what life's all about. Yes. Yeah. We just, we, a lot of times we, we just have to experience it ourselves. We can't just, you know, we can't get an easy pass. None of us. That's what life's all about. Anyone else want to share anything? And the children have to make their mistake. We, you know, we want them to keep from doing the mistake we made. We're going to save them from doing this mistake, their mistake, but they have to make their own mistake, 
-hmm. and that and that's it I mean and we're gonna do some other mistakes we didn't do you know we're gonna come up with something else exactly exactly like our parents didn't want us to do any mistakes and then we don't want our children to do any mistakes but we have to live ourselves and experience it ourselves and you know make our own decision and you know listen to God's voice ourselves it's it's part of it we can't we can't change people we could try we can help but we can't change people so I want to say a story that actually happened to me what happened was um, recently I had a baby like seven months ago and thank you and my husband travels between Austin and Houston like during the week he's a, he's a rabbi on campus in Austin so during the week he's in Austin and for Shabbos we all go together to Austin during the during the year in the summer he's he's off so we're all in Houston together so we do a lot of traveling and obviously you know when you have a baby you just you don't know when the baby's gonna but come you live here yeah we live here and my husband we, we commute but during my ninth month it was very it was tough because it was like when is this baby gonna come and I remember we went to an appointment it was on Monday we had a doctor's appointment we went together and my husband said, I need, to go, I need to go to Austin on Tuesday, and it's already a week before the due date. I need to go to Austin on Tuesday. Does it look like the baby's going to come? No. When are babies most likely to be born? At night. Good, I'll come home at night. Perfect. <laughs> what are the chances? My husband asked the midwife. What are the chances that my wife's going to have a baby tomorrow? Like, almost nothing, like 5%. I think you can go to Austin. No problem. The next day I wake up, and I'm like, you know what, my she, just don't go. I think you should stay. Why? I, I'm just telling you I think you should stay. That day I woke up. I went to work. I'm, I used to teach in the school. I went to work. I came home. I'm like, Moshi, I'm going to have a rest now because I think we're going to have a big day. Just continue staying in Austin. And I had a two-hour rest. I woke up. I was like, okay, Moshi, I think we should go. <laughs> and it was all like, and then we were delaying it because it was we were still weren't sure. And we went to some stores. We did some shopping. And... And there we go, the baby was born, thank God, on that day. And I listened to the voice because everyone was saying there's no reason why, you know, the midwife even said, go to Austin, babies are usually born at night. Women don't even go to, into labor during the day. But nevertheless, I listened to the voice and thank God, you know, to listen to our inner voice, to listen to our neshama is so important. And, you know, sometimes like in this story, I'm lucky to see like, wow, I listened to the voice and it was right. But a lot of times... We listen to that voice and we don't necessarily get an answer right away. Like, were we right? Were we not? And I think that makes it challenging. Did you have the baby at home? Uh, I had a midwife. Yeah, I did. I had a baby. In, I, I did it with a midwife in the hospital, Texas Children's. I had an amazing experience and it all worked out fine. And it was great that I listened to that inner voice, that intuition. It's so important that we have to listen to it. And I want to I just touch upon different areas in the Torah. So many times, and when I was thinking of this, it's more women than men, although I'm sure there are men that are examples so many women that listen to their inner voice, that listen to their neshama in the Torah. So I want to discuss, we have time for around maybe one or two examples of where women listen to their neshama and you see how the story takes place anywhere in Tanakh. I have a couple of examples. Anyone want to share an example? Maybe Hannah and Shmuel, beautiful. Hannah and Shmuel, you want to, you want to share it with us more? No, she's a mother and she wanted a baby and uh, she prayed to God and... Her intuition came through, like beautiful. She prayed, and she prayed so hard. I feel like part of so Hana is a woman. She didn't have she didn't have children for many many years. She was trying to have children for many years, and you would think maybe possibly maybe she would I don't know maybe she would somehow give up you know, but nevertheless she she davened and she prayed so so hard. She was davening by the Mishkan, and the Navi in that time, Shmuel, was there and thought she was drunk because she was like swaying back and forth, back and forth. She looked like a drunk woman. And he accused her of Ellie. being drunk. Why? Tell Ellie. Oh, yeah, thank you, Ailey. Yeah, her son was Shmuel. Thank you, Ailey. So he accused her of being drunk because she so much wanted that child. It was her neshama. Like when our neshama yearns, it's so strong. Like nothing could stop us. Nothing could stop us. And we have that in us too. But Hannah, it was so strong in her. She just stopped and it was in public. She didn't care. She just had that so yearning. It was in her neshama deep inside. She knew. I feel like she must have knew, known she was going to have such a special child like Shmuel. Again, God gifted her that child. She had that intuition. It had to be a woman. Because a man with logic would have said, okay, let me do something else. Let me move on. But Hannah didn't move on. She prayed and she prayed and she didn't care. And there you go. She had that child that she knew intuitively. Her neshama knew that she was going to have Anyone want to share another example? I think when she was pregnant with the two, she knew that they were different. I think she knew Rivka. that, right? But Beautiful. Then, when we have Rivka, she's pregnant, and she's so confused. It says, like, when she passed by a house of idol worship, she, she felt like, you know, 
her baby was kicking. And when she fast passed by, you know, a synagogue or shul, whatever, whatever was around in those days, she felt the other baby kicking. What does that really mean? She felt babies kicking inside of her. I don't believe like Yaakov and Asa were kicking at different times. I think she felt, she felt like their their pull. She felt their pull. She intuitively, which only a woman can do because it's so deep, it's a neshama. She felt the pull on either side, and she knew something is different over here. She knew something was different. Beautiful. I, I love that example. Amazing. Yeah. Anyone else want to share something with I us? I think Moshe's um, mother, the fact that you put him in the Nile River. Beautiful. That's a, an amazing example. Moshe's. So Amram and, and. The other way around was what? To kill him? Like she was like. Your intuition was, I'm going to save my child no matter what. Amazing. So to go deeper in that story, Amram and Yochaved. They're married, and Amram is the leader of the generation, and they're living in the time of Egypt, and Paro says, guess what? Every baby born, born, we're, we're going to kill. We're going to kill. We're going to leave the girls alive. So what does Amram say? I'm going to get divorced. I'm not going to have children. I'm not going to have a child knowing there's a 50% chance that this child is going to die. Are you crazy? For sure, let's get divorced. It's black and white, and Amram was the leader. He got divorced, and guess what? He got divorced. Everyone followed because he was a leader. Everyone got divorced. But I think it was his daughter or his wife. I'm not sure. Daughter, daughter, daughter. His daughter, his daughter, Miriam, who said, one minute, you're worse than Paro. Why are you worse than Paro? You're Because killing the girls too. Beautiful. You're killing the girls too. You're killing the girls. Paro just wants to kill the boys. That's 50% of the population. But what are you doing? You are killing the girls too. So you're worse than Paro. And because of that, Amram, the leader of the generation, got remarried again. And because of his daughter, what happened? Everyone followed the leader of the generation. Everyone got remarried again. And we know the story. Moshe was born. And he, 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 you know, became, he, the leader. he became the leader and took everyone out of Egypt. So again, a great example where a woman was so intuitive, listened to her soul, And again, she, she changed the history of, of the, whole, the whole Jewish nation. She changed the history of Klai Yisrael. Because of that, she listened to her voice and she did something about it. Yeah. Okay, the story of Korach. One of the women <coughs> had the intuition to tell her husband, work out the name of him. Yeah. On, on, not on. Uh, not go. Right. Eh? To stay. She has yeah, she, yeah. Told, she had the sense and the intuition, do not go. This is not for you. And she did what she did, that she uncovered her hair. He couldn't Amazing. go out. They didn't take him. And he was saved. Great example. In the time of Korach, there was, there was one husband who just was following along. And the wife was trying to convince him, stop, stop, stop. But she couldn't. So what she do, I mean, she had to be so intuitive to do this because she uncovered her hair and she uncovered her hair, sat and sat at the doorway. And she just sat there. And the men came to collect him. They're like, oh, no, we can't look at this woman. We can't go here. I mean, what brilliance is this? This is just a woman listening to her neshama. It's she listened to her inner voice to say, wow, this is not okay. Something is not okay. And I need to do something about it. And not just that. She uncovered her hair, which was against halacha, against the law. But that was the right thing to do because she listened to her inner voice. She listened to her neshama. And she, she saved her husband. She saved his life, in, spiritually and physically. So I, I want to end off. How, how can we strengthen our intuition? How can we strengthen ourselves listening to our inner voice, our listening to our neshama? Like you said, we need to do it again and again till we make it stronger. Beautiful. Number yeah. one, yeah. doing it again and again. It's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. The more we do it, the stronger it will become. We'll get better at it. Any other examples? Uh, you Any other thoughts? You daven. Beautiful. Yudavin. That's always a good example for everything. You daven. Davening is an answer for everything. It's, it could be challenging and hard to do. But davening is always a great answer. You daven, you pray to God. You pray to God, pour out your heart to God, heart to God cry, just speak to him. He, he loves you. He loves you more than anyone and anything. It's hard for us to imagine that love. Amazing, beautiful. So, beautiful. So those are the examples. And I had an example. So the more we learn Torah, the more we connect to God. Because Torah is like God speaking to us. And also meditating is also a way... Whatever talks to you, there are so many different examples how we could strengthen this voice. And, you know, some people like meditating, let them meditate. Some people like davening, let them davening. Some people like to learn Torah, let them learn Torah. We could all, we could all strengthen that voice, that neshama, that our soul, in a different way, whatever talks to us. So I want to end off that. We're so lucky that we're women. We have this inner voice. We have this neshama speaking to us. And knowing you, like you guys had so much to say, And we, you, all of us, we have our neshama shining in us. We have our soul shining in us. And we're so lucky that we can use it. And thank you all for joining. And I love what you all said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone know how to turn this off? What's your name again?
Feige. My name is Feige. Feige Trap. Feige Trap. Yeah, Feige. What's your name again?